welcome everyone to our 2022-23 Yammer and Viva Engage benchmarking briefing session. Session: Are you surviving or thriving? We're proud to release SWOOP's eighth annual Yammer benchmarking report. And this is probably the last Yammer benchmarking report we're going to do before it becomes a Viva Engage benchmarking report. So we also appreciate that this is a long report. I think we're up to about 120 pages this year, and there's a lot of information to digest. So we decided to host this session today to walk you through the report, um, to give you the chance to hear from the world's number one Yemma community manager, and to ask lots of questions. So this is a really interactive session. Please don't hesitate to raise your hand or pop a question in the chat, or if you like, just take you, yourself off mute and jump in and ask a question anytime. So we'll get straight to it. But before we begin, oh, my slides aren't working here. Oh, goodness, sorry. Let's see if I can move this along. I'd like to um, do an acknowledgement of country. So in the spirit of reconciliation, Swoop Analytics acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respect to their elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. So I'm on Narrago country in the New South Wales Snowy Mountains. So I'd like to say Nurinj, which is welcome in Narrago language. So our agenda today, we're just going to welcome you all. We're going to kick off our session today with an audience poll. So we're just going to ask you guys um, first a few questions to see where you are in your Yemen networks. Are they surviving or are they thriving? Um, then Laurie, Dr. Lawrence Lockley, our Swoop Analytics Chief Scientist, is going to go through the key findings from our Yemen benchmarking report. Then we'll announce the Collaboration Champion Award winners for 2022-23. And I think this is going to be the highlight of our session. We've got a Q&A with Fiona Roberts from Westpac, New Zealand. I can guarantee you're going to learn a lot from Fiona. And an audience Q&A. So as I said, please jump in with questions in the chat um, or raise your hand or just jump, take yourself off mute and ask questions. So just to introduce everybody, um, there's our SWOOP's Chief Data Scientist is Dr. Lawrence Lockley. Welcome, Laurie. And I'm very pleased to welcome Fiona Roberts from Westpac, New Zealand. Fiona's joining us from Auckland. Fiona is the Senior Digital Engagement Manager at Westpac, New Zealand. Um, myself, I'm the Director of Communications at SWOOP. And from Seattle, we've got Coco Molina, who's our Director for North America. So we're going to kick off our um, webinar today by just asking you guys a few questions. So there's two options here. If you grab your phone, you can scan this QR code and it will take you to the Menti poll, or you can uh, go into menti.com and you use this code 23631746 and that will take you. So I am just going to switch screens now and we'll go into the Menti poll and I hope this works. <laughs> so we'll go in here. Oh, yes, it's working because people are voting. Thank you. <laughs> so the first question we have is, do you feel readership on Yammer and Viva Engage has increased or decreased in the most recent 12 months? So we're not talking about engagement so much, but this is readership. Um, Laurie's going to get more into this with our findings, but we're talking about, you know, what we'd often call the lurkers, those people that are reading um, in Yammer, but they're not posting, replying, commenting, not engaging in any way. So, oh, that's great that, yeah, we've seen a lot of increases there coming through and not too many decreases, which, uh, Laurie, I think this matches in with your findings. So you'll be able to speak to this a little bit more. Well, I'll just move now to our next slide, which is a really similar question. Do you feel engagement on Yammer and Viva Engage has increased or decreased in the most recent 12 months? So this is engagement. Oh, this is great. So we have seen some increases in engagement happening. Laurie, you'll find this interesting. Mm -hmm. It's a bit different to what we uh, we found in some of the results. Okay, no decreases, which is wonderful. 
Okay, interesting to know. So Laurie, I'll let you talk to all these when, when you get to the findings. And our final question is, we're really looking this year into thriving communities on Yemma. So we'd love to know the name of your most thriving community. Um, so, it, you know, it might just be your all company um, community. Um, I know we've got a case study in the benchmarking report and I know their most thriving was the bad dad jokes community. Um, Oh, here's one coming through, all transport. Fraud, corruption and security awareness. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting. Yeah. If anyone else wants to jump in with a few um, names of their most thriving communities. Oh, the music corner. This really, uh, that fits in with a lot of the findings we found, right, Laurie? Yeah. Mm. Let's pull up. Okay, so we've got a few coming through there. Fur Kids, yes. I love the name Fur Kids because it's <laughs> often uh, cats or dogs, so it covers both bases. And the social stuff, exactly what we found from the, um, from the benchmarking. A neurodiverse neighbourhood, that's really interesting. Yeah, and lots of social communities. War on stuff, that's interesting. <laughs> I wonder what it is. Doggo's photography. Yeah, see, there's a bit of a theme going on with some of these. Well, that is great. I um, will go back to the presentation now and um, move to our next screen. The black screen of deaths popped up. Oh, <laughs> sorry. And then I'm going to hand over to Laurie. Well, Laurie, while I get this screen going, I'm going to hand yeah. over to you to start talking about um, your key report. findings from the report. Yeah. Okay. I'll stop so, sharing for a sec. Well. So the uh, screen that Sharon is about to, to share. Uh, it's basically saying a little bit about the report itself. I think we had about 97 organisations that have, we looked at over 3,000 communities and, you know, umpteen numbers of staff and interactions and so forth. But but largely what we tried to do this year was, was only select data that for organisations within the COVID period. So this is from March 2020 on. So maybe I sampled slightly smaller than previous years, but nevertheless, you know, a significant number of organisations. Uh, those of you that aren't familiar with how Squid benchmarks, it's not a it's not a sampling situation. We actually take interactions. You have to connect to Swoop and we take everybody's interactions. So so everybody is represented in our benchmarking. It's a complete sample. So, uh, so now we can move on to the next slide, Sharon. Sort of. Uh, so the key findings. So we have we 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 characterise these as five findings. Now, in terms of Yammer participation and certainly for counting readership, that has gone up and it's doubled since 2020. Now, now we put a lot of that down to uh, the fact that you know, Yammer has been opened up to Outlook and to to uh, Teams. And a lot of the uh, gateways into Yammer these days is coming through those channels according according to Microsoft. So the overall readership has gone up, but in fact, the active participation and what we call in Swoop active participation, you have to at least push the like button at least once, you know, and and to be active. Uh, and we've seen proportionately that has actually reduced, you know, and also because our measures, Swoop measures are, are relationship centered, you know, we, we do very much focus on people-to-people -people connection. So when we talk about engagement, we talk about people-to-people -people engagement. That's connecting people to other people. So it's an, a narrower definition, I guess, than a lot of you might have been thinking in terms of what engagement means. But 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 it's important, and, and I'll go to that later. So when we look at the proportionate sort of measures of those engagement measures, that swoop measures, and the overall population that's actually accessing or reading on Yammer, it's actually gone backwards, you know, and, uh, you know, and Fiona, who's on the call, you know, she was a little bit distraught, I think, earlier in the year saying, oh, we're going backwards, we're going backwards. And we said, look, you know, actually, you're the best in the 97 organisations. You know, this is a this is a, a global trend. It's not something that's particular to your organisation. Uh, but, you know, we have qualifiers for that. So whilst we might think that 
going backwards is bad. You know, in fact, uh, the theme that we're sort of promoting is we need to go backwards to go forwards with a bigger cohort. So the next slide, um, Sharon. Uh, so as I said, the, the challenge now is to say, all right, we've got a lot more people. In fact, you know, largely wow. nearly all the organisation on Yammer now, mostly reading, but how do we convert these readers, passive users, to more active participants in Yammer? And that's something that, you know, we're going to be watching over the next four months or two years, if you like. So the, um, uh, also this year, uh, we have embellished our community measurement for performance to include a number of factors for thriving. So you'll hear this, this term thriving communities, and I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit more in a later slide. So we're actually measuring how thriving communities are in this in this uh, this year's report. And then finally, as part of that, we always have a futures area, and this futures area is, a, is an area where I get to play about and speculate about what's coming. Uh, this year, one of the areas I was keen to look at was what does a, a leader, an effective leader post-pandemic look like? Now, now people generally feel that they don't not going to look like the leaders that we had pre-pandemic. Right. So what we did here is that, well, uh, we'll see. I'll, I'll leave this discussion to, lo to, to the later slide. So let's go to the next slide, Sharon. So, um, oh, I've pressed it, Laurie. Something's going on with this slide okay. deck. So largely what, so I'm going to concentrate on, on firstly, looking at the, the, this trend of participation uh, over, um, over the last six or seven years. So we've been doing uh, Yammer benchmarking for eight years now. So this is our eighth report. And there are some trends that are worth worth sort of following. Uh, and, and then the next part, we're going to look at this whole thriving communities part, you know, so uh, pretty fascinating, actually. I think that um, uh, it's a word that we're going to see more of. Interestingly, Microsoft, in an article they published in the HBR, said that they no longer are measuring employee engagement. In fact, what they're measuring is employee thriving. Now, sort of that really caught our attention uh, because everything was engagement, 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 including Viva engagement. So uh, we sort of speculated that maybe it'll be called Viva thriving sometime in the future. But uh, I think in terms of labelling, uh, Microsoft is treading fairly carefully at the moment. So, so we're not likely to see that. And then I just want to go into that little bit about the, the, the post-pandemic uh, leader, the hybrid leader, and what might that look like? And this is clearly in the actual um, uh, futures part, uh, but I'm, we're certainly going to do some more research in that area, and we're certainly open to organisations connecting with us and saying, look, we're interested in what our future hybrid leaders might look like. So if you're interested in that, certainly reach out to us. So next slide, Sharon. Okay, so participation and less engagement. So when I say engagement, as I said, we're talking about people-to-people -people engagement. Uh, one of the qualifiers for this moving backwards to go forwards is that the uh, organisations that we're benchmarking are getting bigger. You know, so now on this graph we are counting average user accounts. Now, it, this can be a bit problematic. So depending on how you govern your accounts, some organisations will have many, many more accounts than they have employees. And that can be problematic. But nevertheless, what we've seen in the last three years, that that, that number has gone up uh, considerably. And so uh, next slide, uh, Sharon. Now, this is the one of the important slides about going backwards to go forwards. Now, those of you that have been uh, associated with our benchmarking will see that little, in the background here, we've got the maturity sort of model, the one that Swoop uh, works to and you know how we attach our measures to and you can see there's three stages of social media social networking and job fulfillment and we say that the job fulfillment was when you know the real rubber hits the road the real tangible benefits come but in fact what we're seeing is that you know this looks like a staircase right what we're seeing in practice it's not a staircase at all you know in fact some people might think it's a little bit like a snakes and ladders, you know, we start marching up the, the maturity curve and all of a sudden something happens and we end up sliding back and, you know, we get a new CEO or, or there's something disruptive happening in the marketplace and so forth. Now, we see this moving back uh, is partly because the audience is bigger, right? There's more people reading, there's more people participating. And, and with that, the overall metrics have moved back, but now the challenge is to move that bigger cohort forward. 
and it's more than likely not going to be a linear journey. So let's move on to the next next uh, part, Sharon. Not Trying, moving. Sorry, not moving. <laughs> okay, so uh, in essence, the um, uh, yeah, this is a build. So the slide that that uh, we would have liked to show here is the um, basically the last six years that we've benchmarked and we've looked at the participation. And with participation, what what Swoop does, what we've been doing since day one, is not so much measuring readership, but we've been measuring observers and the size of the observer sort of cohort in within Swoop, our dashboard. An observer is defined as somebody who is active less than once every two weeks, right? So if you push the like button less than once every two weeks, we call you an observer, which is pretty much a passive sort of user. But we know you're breathing because you've actually touched something in Yammer, right? So when we've looked at that in the past, that number of participation, that in other words, reducing percent observers, has been going up and up and up pretty consistently until we hit COVID, right? The engagement measures, which is really the, the core measure, is our two-way measure. And a two-way relationship is formed when, say, you post something, someone else replies to that, and they post something and you reply to that. So we, we call that a two-way interaction. And we think that's a very strong measure of people-to-people -people engagement. In fact, we know it is because we've, we've, we've analysed this forever. Um, so when we see those, those two measures, they were marching up nicely together. And then we hit COVID and then the participation started, percentage started to drop. And then this year it was the first time that engagement and participation dropped together. Now that that is quite disturbing when you see that. But in essence, also we've seen this huge rise in the in the people that are actually touching Emma, even, even as just readers. So so that's why we're saying we need to go backwards, recognise that in previous years, we've dealt with a cohort, which is maybe 30 to 40 percent of, uh, of your organisation. Now we're going back with 80 to 90 percent of your organisation and then trying to move them forward in the in the coming years. So that's why we're saying it's going backwards to go forwards. Right? So um, uh, we'll share these slides with you so you'll see, see them, I think, but they are bills, unfortunately. and. And it seems that Teams does funny things when there's a lot of people on because this always works perfectly in the in the rehearsal. So um, let's go to the thriving communities slide. Um, um, yes, OK, so as I said, what we did with with the thriving communities and this was, as I said, was prompted by an article uh, published in the Harvard Business Review by Microsoft that said they were no longer measuring employee engagement. You know, they were measuring employee thriving. And they did that with a survey mainly, but they also used some of the workplace analytics to sort of help them with, with that assessment about thriving communities. Uh, interestingly, in 2021, we actually measured the happiness of communities using our sentiment analysis. And what we discovered there, that's the graph with um, which we're showing where we're going, going down together, sorry. But, if we can get to this one, yes. So this is the actual article. If you want to look it up, you, it is one of the ones that you can freely get to. You don't have to subscribe. Uh, June, it was only in June this year. And the authors are actually part of Microsoft's people analytics sort of uh, uh, function. So uh, quite confronting, I think. Um, but nevertheless, it was quite welcome, I think, by a lot of people. And uh, because we we actually had measure, used sentiment to measure if you like, the happiness of communities by just adding a couple more factors. And one was 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 growth, because when we talk about thriving things, whether it's a garden or a baby or what have you, you know, it's associated with growth. So we can measure growth in communities in terms of their activity or membership. And we did. Uh, we also added one other measure, which was we expected that a thriving community would have some activity at least every working day. So five days in seven, we'd expect that there'd be some activity. When we applied these extra measures on top of our already comprehensive performance measures, you know, that number of 3,200 communities that we assessed reduced to about 400, a little over 400 communities. So we had 400 that we could measure as thriving. And then of course we picked the top, we always pick the top 10% or in fact the top 10, 
to reach out and see you know, what are these communities doing you know and uh, thankfully for swoop every time we identify uh, analytically a community or an organization uh, we don't have uh, you know, names or anything like that we only have id numbers we have to go back to the actual organization and say can you tell us what this from this id can you tell us what this community is or what who this person is that's particularly good and uh, and then we draw the stories from them so uh, so let's move on to the next slide uh, sharon so now to give you a, an idea of what who these thriving communities were um it's going to get stuck again, isn't it, Sharon? It is. So, so uh, oh, no. <laughs> nevertheless, there was three classes of of communities, right? There was the one was was what we call the purpose driven communities. These are the LGBTQIQ. These are the Me Too. These are the the sustainability. These are the vaccination communities. These are the ones that are attracting a huge, diverse community of employees actively participating in in thriving discussions around these societal topics that have actually moved inside the organisation. Now, we saw this trend uh, last year, in fact, and in fact, it caused some aggravation to some of our uh, community manager communities because, you know, all of a sudden they are now having to, to moderate a, a, a community that was talking about societal issues that weren't necessarily directly related to the business, if you like. Now, what we've learned, uh, you know, in the pre, in the over this COVID period, that these aren't non-work communities, right? They are, they are communities that really represent your diversity and equity and inclusion policy in practice in the organisation. And certainly, my thinking about this has changed when I look at our our maturity sort of uh, model. You know, sort of, whilst I still th think it's valid, I think that period of where you're connecting with other people in your organisation, which is the middle phase. Is, is really what is being represented by this now. So people are connecting with each other around these sort of purpose-driven communities. And, you know, and then from that, they're building that sort of trust and psychological safety, which they can then take into the more business-oriented sort, of, uh, sort of processes, whether they're solving complex problems or innovating with new products and so forth at that job fulfillment phase. So I think this is something that we've certainly learned about. Not only purpose driven, we saw some very thriving organisations around what we would traditionally call non work. So the dad's jokes sort of community, you know, the, uh, you know, what else? The, obviously, pets, pets. And Matt's on the call here. He, when he was at Bank West, he, he went into bat for the pets communities. Everybody has a pets community, right? But people are connecting, and we're seeing a growing number of connections that have been built in those communities actually surfacing in other innovation activities that are more directly uh, business related. So I think that's that that's been very important for us to learn that, you know, so these are work communities now. They're not just, you know, on the side or what have you. So organisations are embracing that and the executive need to need to take a stance. You know, in fact, the staff are demanding that they have a stance and, and a personal one. So we, we're seeing examples where executives are are actually exposing their personal view on some of these issues and the staff really want to know what they are you know? so i think that was that's a big learning from from certainly this year and last year for that matter uh, i'm not uh, sure what we're up and, to uh, now laurie and sharon would it be helpful if i shared the slide on my screen um, very helpful thank you Kai. Right. no problem i'll do that <laughs> See if no we problem. have more success. Yeah, so no, sorry yeah, about yeah. that. I don't but know why nearly, it's nearly not working. at the end of my year. So mm -hmm. in essence, when we so when we pick the top, you know, the top thriving communities, how did they differ from the other communities that weren't thriving? Well, first of all, we found they were four times larger on average, right? So they're bigger, you know, sort of. We also found that the participation level was much higher, forty percent higher than on the non-thriving communities. And then when we looked at our performance measure from 2021, which didn't include the thriving measures, you know, they were not nearly 20% higher in performing. So these thriving communities are actually engaging, they are adding value, they are things that we should worry about. And in fact, you know, maybe Viva Engage should be relabeled to Viva Thrive and we should adjust our measures in that way. So moving on, Kai, I think if you're able to move your screen or... Uh, so I think let's let's move these through fairly quickly because we're running late. But as I think I've already talked to these, so this is an example of 
of it's a pride pride sort of posting. So let's move on, Kai, to to another one. This is an example. Well, engaging the front line. I should talk a little bit about that because that's another common theme that is more directly business focused, but it's about uh, how the front line. The, one of the examples I was going to show was. Uh, it was the ANZ Bank who have a, have a community in the Philippines where the formal role of the community is IT people supporting people working from home technically. You know, is my machine working, all this sort of stuff. But it turned out that the uh, community leader, one of the community leaders, was passionate about sustainability and growing your, your own food at home. And she started swapping hints about how you can grow your food at home and, in fact, started giving away plants to the the Philippines community and all of a sudden it became the most thriving community on, on ANZ sort of uh, charter and they have lots of communities so and that, that was actually helping the front line. We saw a number of other examples of this and you'll see those in the report so uh, and then finally Kai I think we're running out of time now but the final one was really looking at the uh, the leaders you know looking at these leaders and the, what I did there was we'll get to that slide Kai but um, we looked at, what I did was looked at, I think we had about 11, 1200 people across four organisations. So by our standards, it's a bit of a smaller sample, but generally a pretty big sample. I was interested in, in who are the people that sustained reciprocated relationships on Yammer and on Teams and shared content in SharePoint, right? So these are the three big things. And you can see, you know, once you look at that, there's some outstanding leaders, you know, so, um, uh, so we again we only have ID numbers. So we go back and we ask people, you know, well, who are these people? Are they anything special? Well, interestingly, one organisation came back and said, well, that one of those people just got voted the, the most valuable employer by their peers in our whole organisation. Two others were actually founders of the organisation, so they were they were already organisational leaders, passionate about what they do, um, and you know. This is enough encouragement for me, at least, to say, look, there's something in this. You know, if organisations can predict who their post-COVID leaders are going to be, I think we've got something here that might help. You know, so so that's why I said we're going to we're going to sort of drill a bit more into this. Uh, one of the leaders uh, was with Real Foundations. It's on the next slide, Kai. Uh, uh, David is Stanford is a, a co-founder of Real Foundation. This organisation deals in real estate consulting. It has been in our leadership group, leader leaders group for Yammer, for Teams, for M365. It's always there. Uh, David, who actually I haven't met, I've met the CEO and talked regularly with the CEO, but David is one of the other co-founders. He's actually written how he works. He's written an article in a real estate magazine about how he works, and there, and he's even got a YouTube. So in the report, we reference that. And, and I believe that people like David, he is the archetype of what the, the future hybrid working leaders should look like. And I might add, Real Foundations have been doing this well before the pandemic came along. They, they've always been like us, been a remote organisation. You know, you know, they obviously do have offices because there's, you know, there's four or 500 people. They've got operations in India as well. But but nevertheless, you know, they've had this, this flexible style of working from day one. So uh, I, I, I commend you looking at, uh, at David's sort of suggestions about how we should work and so forth. So. Anyway, I think it's time to hand over to Sharon now uh, to identify who our winners were. <laughs> this is my favourite part, Laurie. Yeah, um, go for it. To announce our Collaboration <laughs> Champion Award winners for 2022-23. So you'll see some of the big names there. And I can see, for example, Kim from NRMA is on the call. Congratulations, Kim. There's such an amazing case study in the report. Yay! <laughs> uh, amazing case study in the report from Kim, CEO of Motoring and Membership, which I totally recommend you read. It's, um, I think it will resonate with a lot of you on the call. Um, Kim, I'm right, Anna, your CEO, she was pretty hesitant and pretty like anxious and a little bit nervous to start with about going on to, to Yemma. Now it's just an everyday part of her life, like five minutes, 10 minutes, or as she's waiting to pick up her kids, she'll jump on for half an hour and just respond to conversations happening on Yemma. Um, I'm sure a lot of you on the call will be pretty jealous to hear of a CEO who, who engages like that on Yemma. 
Um, we've got a, some great case studies from some of the world's biggest organisations, the Home Depot, for example, half a million employees and how they're using Yammer. There's a great um, case study there on using it for frontline workers and actually helping to sell products. So totally recommend those. But in APAC, our number one um, large size organisation was ANZ. So I don't know whether I can't see anyone from ANZ on the call at the moment, but I'm sure somebody is. So congratulations to ANZ. So the interesting thing with ANZ is they were number one for APAC and the world for a large size organisation, but they were actually even in the top eight, I think, from the 97 organisations we benchmarked. This is an organisation with more than 50,000 people. So that alone is pretty amazing because I'm sure a lot of you have discovered that the larger your Yemen network gets, it can get harder to, you know, um, have every community engage. And in this benchmarking for overall, we are looking at every um, Yemen community within your organisation. So the high performing and the low performing ones. Um, so we had a first this year, the number one organisation from all 97 that we benchmarked was Westpac New Zealand. It, we've never had a medium sized organisation top the benchmarking before. It's always been a small size organisation. So um, we're going to talk to Fiona very shortly from Westpac New Zealand and we'll hear all about that. And our small size organisation winner from APAC is Meridian Energy, which is a green energy company also based in New Zealand. So the Kiwis have had outstanding performances this year. Yes, go to the Kiwis, Fiona. <laughs> um, so there's case studies in the report from all of these organisations. So thank you to everyone who contributed to them as well. Kai, we'll move on to the next slide and we'll start having a chat with Fiona. Um, so Fiona, thank you for joining us. And Fiona's based in Auckland. So thanks for joining us from Auckland. So Fiona, perhaps the thing that stood out the most for me after speaking with you is that even though Westpac New Zealand was the number one Yemen network out of all 97 that we benchmarked this year, you were pretty surprised because you'd seen some drops in the swoop measure, your swoop measures compared with other years. Um, so Laurie did explain earlier that that was a reflection across all the benchmarking worldwide. Can you give heart to everybody else on the call? Why do you think that there has been a drop in some of those measures? Ah, thanks for having me, Sharon. Um, <laughs> you know, it, it's 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 thrilling. It's both thrilling and terrifying to be here because you know I feel like we've got imposter syndrome, um, <laughs> and uh, because uh, you know before you you contacted me to say we'd got the number one award. I had been on the call with Emily uh, saying to her, look, I don't think we're doing very well and I don't really understand um, why I've got my thoughts on this. And I really thought, you know, we had, had been struggling in this space, really trying to get engagement, but um, failing miserably, we, we thought, um, and it turns out not to be the case. Um, but listen, I think it's because we, you know, we're, we're in a, a tricky environment at the moment. Um, New Zealand in particular has uh, really struggled with COVID and lockdowns. It's been a long haul for us. Uh, and I'm sure if there are Kiwis on the call, I can speak to this. But um, <clears throat> it did feel like we were having quite a lot of post-COVID fatigue um, this year and quite a lot of things going on, I guess, politically, economically. Um, <clears throat> with health, with um, COVID continuing to, you know, keep us in a sort of a pandemic state. So um, I think all of those things took people's eye off the ball necessarily and, you know, gave them a lot of things to think about um, and, and probably just too many places to look for information. Mm -hmm. Fiona, I know one of the ways you've gotten a lot of engagement on Yammer is, and when we've been chatting, you've said this, is you, you just put fun things on, things that aren't work related. Um, tell yeah. me a little bit about some of those fun <laughs> things that you put on and, and let's then we can talk about why you do that. I think, you know, look, we, we, we're really lucky here in that, you know, it's We've got still got a relatively small number of people, although you know somebody might say, "Well, five thousand employees, not that small," but it does feel like a smallish community to us. 
uh, we are really fortunate that our people, you know, all sort of pull together in the same direction. Um, but the, the important thing for our Yammer community right from day dot was that it was there for our people and it was really important to have a sense of fun, uh, a sense of playfulness. Um, we monitor it, but we don't really monitor it in a sense of, you know, you can't say this or do that. So um, having fun is one of the ways that we help that community feel like a community. Um, so if I think about our building, for example, you know, I treat it not as a, a building plonked in the middle of, of, an, of a locale. I think of it as a neighbourhood and that we you know we're really lucky here to be surrounded by fantastic coffee shops. We're surrounded by artists and bakers and uh, companies doing interesting things, pop-up stores. And so I wanted to bring that fun and that flavor really into the, the Yammer community that supports um, this particular building. So we know, for example, that our people are really keen on food. I think like many, uh, many an organization, we're fueled on coffee. Uh, we're also fueled on our cheese scones and our yummy things in our, in our staff cafe. Uh, so, you know, I um, bring that sort of flavor, as it were, into Yammer every day, <coughs> go down and take pictures of what's on offer or um, things happening you know, food stalls, food trucks even, that's happening outside of the building uh, so that people will get a chance to see, you know, the vibrancy, not just of this building, but what's going on around it. I guess that's a bit of a draw card for hybrid working, right, to get people back into the <laughs> office too, especially in New Zealand yeah. where you had one of the world's longest lockdowns. I think mm. people probably got pretty comfy maybe at home. And so is that part of it too, is like luring people back to the office maybe one day a week or something? Oh, absolutely. I think we um, we wanted to lure people back in. We wanted them to come back in and, and experience the you know, the, the Westpac life and to, you know, to go for those coffee meetings and those lunch meetings. So it was always really important for me to kind of showcase what they might be missing out on because, you know, FOMO is a, is a real thing. And, uh, you know, in our cafe, we have fried chicken Friday. So just literally <laughs> posting a picture of um, the cafe lunch on a Friday was a great way to get people back into the building. And uh, we had a lot of people commenting, oh, I, you know, I'm working from home today. Um, I, I'm missing out. So, you know, they knew if they came in, they would actually get to experience what, what we were seeing. Yeah, well, see, that alone's a really great takeaway, Fiona. And I'm not sure if Ree from Box Hills on this um, in this webinar as well, but Ree had a really similar story from one of their campuses that they were doing like roast Wednesday, roast. Roast, roast Wednesdays, I think it was, in the cafe. And that, again, it was sort of getting people back and, you know, experiencing what it could be like back in the office. So that might be a good takeaway for anyone on the call. Just start posting food, come, come back to the office one day a week. So obviously, Fiona, you get a lot of engagement by, just by doing that. That's sort of that fun, showing people what's going on in the workplace, that type of thing. But I know we've spoken about this by doing that um, and people commenting on those posts. Well, one, it's allowing people to practice using Yammer, right? And then the next thing is you're building those relationships. And I guess you were explained to me that even doing those sorts of posts is turning Yammer into a really safe space where people can just talk about their days, like their day-to-day -day life and their days. Can you tell me a little bit more along about, you know, how it is becoming, moving from that fun into a safe space to talk about, you know, other issues? I think trust is really important. You know, I think people have to be able to feel like they can have their say. And I think sometimes in a big corporate, you might not necessarily feel that way. Um, but our culture is really moving in a space where we can constructively challenge things and, and we wanted to make sure that that was reflective in Yammer as well so that, you know, we've been able to have posts on relatively controversial topics like vaccination, for example, um, unmonitored, but um, still, you know, everyone has been able to, you know, put their views forward and share stuff that's quite personal. I was quite yeah. surprised about um, 
the Hi, vulnerability. Can you move to the next post. And we, we can talk. <laughs> we've got some. No, 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 Fiona. Just because you're talking about the vaccinations, we've got mm. some examples there. Yeah. Um, you know, people sharing videos of their families and, um, you know, their grandparents or their children or reasons why they felt vaccination was important for them. Uh, and I was actually really, really surprised. Um, there was one post in particular uh, from a man whose wife was going through stage four breast cancer and, you know, the vulnerability of that and just the way that the community rallied around him and supported him and, you know, acknowledged <clears throat> what he was saying and showed a lot of care and love and understanding. So, you know, it's been a really lovely space for that as well, particularly through some of these, you know, darker times that we've been experiencing, like, like COVID lockdowns. Mm. I thought this one, this really resonated with me because speaking with a lot of other customers and especially some um, big, big organisations in the US, they were, they really had to shut down conversations on things like COVID um, and, you know, there were some other contentious topics. So they ended up having to shut them down because they were getting out of hand. I loved it with your post. And I think maybe it comes from this building the trust that you were talking about before. Mm. You know, this was a campaign where Westpac New Zealand was, in, I guess, encouraging in a very soft way people to be vaccinated and were asking people why why are you getting vaccinated and people were sharing these very very personal stories but you said there was nothing um negative on there people were respecting mm. each other which um you know i'm sure a lot of people on this on this call would have had seen you know both sides of it but do you think a lot of mm. this is built from that initial trust that you were talking about you know, as I said, I think right from the get go, you were so keen to make sure that it was a really safe space for people that they could have their say that they could do post where they want um, on the topic that they wanted. Uh, a lot of people have reached out to me over the years and say, um, you know, where do I post like anywhere you want, really? Yeah. Um, and, you know, people are really kind of, they're really nurturing you, you, and particularly if people are quite vulnerable, you'll see a lot of reaction to that, a lot of like, a lot of, um, you know, love reactions. Uh, and so we are really lucky now that we <clears throat> have this um, very safe network for people. Hmm. And I've got to do a little plug there for Swoop. You can see down in the bottom left hand corner, <laughs> it was one of the most engaging posts. So you could see then the reactions and the shares, that type of thing. Yeah. There is a Hi. question uh, from the uh, um, uh, from the audience here about the yeah. use of all company. And I think Fiona, you might be really good at answering this one. Um, this is uh, Alice uh, asking, um, she's uh, launching Yammer um, and want to be clear in communities and, and saying, well, what, how do we use the old company? And uh, you know, some people have said, oh, don't post there because it's, you know, it's too noisy and too much happening. But what's your advice based on your experience with, uh, with, uh, with PAC New Zealand? How do you use or would you recommend the use of old company? It's an interesting one because we never actually set out with a strategy for all company and we've never restricted it. We have thriving communities for all sorts of topics. We've got hundreds of communities on, on literally everything work-based to everything non-work-based, you know, the dad jokes and the, you know, the peak pictures. Um, but we've never specified what you use all company for and so we do get a myriad of things and yes it can it can get very busy um we had a situation last week where was it the week before where it was uh diwali in new zealand and and so we had you know just um tens and tens of posts of people showing their uh, diwali pictures from all around the country and I thought that was really beautiful that they felt really safe to post it where everyone could see it, not just in the communities that mattered most to them. Uh, and I think that's, you know, I think that's a reflection of how we run our, our network. It may not necessarily be for everyone, um, but it does, you know, it does allow people to express themselves in any way that they see fit on all sorts of topics. 
uh, it'd be interesting to see for us how storylines start mm. to develop versus communities. Um, watch this space. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> so yeah. We are watching that space, Fiona, because mm. for some reason. <laughs> Don't know the answer to that <laughs> yet. Yeah, yeah. And interestingly, and just, we just found... one more, one more oh, yeah. little comment. I, I just uh, so I just for everyone in the chat, if you have uh, experiences about how to use Law Company, I saw a comment from from uh, from Sally. Please put them in the chat. But I, I know Sarah, you're probably keen to uh, make sure we move forward. Oh yeah, but oh, I was also just about to say with the um, All Company, we found that when we looked at the thrive, most thriving communities, that um, you yeah. would have seen in when we did the Mentimeter poll, like the All Transport, that was Transport New South Wales, and there that was their All Company feed. They ended up being, um, you know, quite a lot, wasn't it, Laurie? In that top ten, yeah, I think yeah. there was and at least did. about four that were All Company. And communities. we had the same. We had the same with Europe and North America sort of uh, earlier in the week. So, yeah, uh, we, we uh, when we saw this this trend, we sort of thought, oh, no, we've been always telling people stay out of the old company, you know, work in the communities. But I think what we saw was that some of the important campaigns were being run in all company. You know, so they weren't just anybody. It wasn't the anybody noise type stuff. They were purposely, purposefully using the all company feed for campaigns and and um, and I think yeah. that's largely why why they were showing up. So it wasn't like all of a sudden people decided not to worry about what happened there. I think they were more purposefully using the all company feed and and quite effectively, in fact. So we are seeing this this trend, if you like, of purposefully using the all company feed uh, rather than just trying to lock it down because there's too much noise, you know. So. I think that's something that we have had seen certainly this year um, um, around the world. Well, Kai, can we move to the next slide? Because I think everyone's going to love this one. And I think it sort of is telling of the progression that Fiona's, or the journey that Fiona's been taking us on, you know, starting with um, making Yemma a fun place, building the trust, talking about controversial things. Well, this campaign, um, I'll hand over to you to explain more in a moment, Fiona, but it was the first uh, campaign that was, it was an external campaign to get first home buyers um, into Westpac. But at the same time, you ran an internal Yemma campaign. And mm -hmm. the thing that was so interesting is you actually had, thanks, thanks to measuring some of this with Swoop, of course, you actually <laughs> had um, definable ROI as a result of doing this on internally on Yemma. So take it away, Fiona, and tell us all about this, <laughs> how you can you, you can make money for your organisation using Yemma. <laughs> uh, yes. Well, I think like many countries, we're facing into a situation where it's getting harder for first home buyers to buy a home. We've got rising interest rates um, and sort of a little bit of tricky times economically here. So we want to run a campaign to get our share of um, the first first home buyers market. Uh, and it was a really interesting decision taken by um, our regional managers in the business. So th these are the teams that um, help corral our branches and customer facing staff who um, interact with our customers on a daily basis. Uh, a decision, a deliberate decision by them to use Yammer to engage <laughs> staff to help customers. So, you know, rather than saying, here's the campaign, you know, go and talk to your customers about, um, you know, about home loans, uh, they decided to use Yammer as an engagement tool. So how could they get branch staff rallying behind this? Um, and it was a really interesting thing that they did. They, um, they actually ran a competition which uh, was actually about, you know, tell us your stories about how you've helped a customer into a, into a new home. And it actually became then a catch-all for what are we doing in our branch to engage customers? And so you what you see on the screen is just a a very small sample of the sorts of things that they did, but it was great. They they made videos, um, 
they made <laughs> you'll see there one of the pictures is actually making you know making a house out of um, the marketing materials and putting that on a wall um, they showcased themselves you know with home loan tips they shared what they were doing to help other branches um, and it became a rallying cry for branches across the country to get behind this campaign uh, and we actually followed the campaign weekly so that we could see what was going on we could see who the influencers were in the campaign we could see you know which branches were doing an amazing job uh, and which branches or areas were lagging behind and needed a bit more of incentive or a bit more help um, and so it was a it was a good one to track what we found at the end was actually the success of this campaign and the success of the branch initiatives so those branches that and areas that did really well actually then contributed to the financial results of the campaign mm -hmm. so um, a direct correlation between engagement and dollars as it were wow. uh, so that was absolutely fantastic and i think the um I think the teams went away and, you know, just kind of had a light bulb moment, really, of, oh my gosh, here's this great opportunity to, to get in behind the campaigns and things, initiatives that we do for our customers, in a very tangible way. So, you know, obviously they're off the back of this, they're already planning what they can do next. Such a great story to hear that, Fiona. And I, I guess this is why you are the number one Yemma network, <laughs> you know, with these sorts of innovations. Um, well, it's it's there are things that we have done before. I think this um, I think what we're seeing is just more maturity in how this is playing out now. So rather than just dabbling to see what's happening, it's an engaged, sustained campaign using analytics to really drive outcomes. Uh, and I think what we're seeing is that that's really coming to fruition now. You know, we, the, um, we've, ta we've taken the learnings and are now getting experienced people running these sorts of campaigns. Has anyone got any questions that they'd like to ask Fiona or, or Dr. Lawrence Lockley as well? We can jump in and pop your questions in the chat or raise your hand if you do have anything you'd like to ask. But while we're, while we're waiting on any questions to come through, Kai, can you move along to the next slide, please? I can't leave you guys without getting everyone to download our benchmarking report. So I think the link's been shared in the chat as well. Oh, thanks, Coco. Um, so as Laurie said, 21 million Yammer interactions and within this report are all the case studies. Fiona is in there. Um, the NRMA one I was talking about, there's even one from Transport New South Wales. So there's um, lots of information. Totally recommend you register and receive the report today. And we have got coming up very shortly, the Yemma Festival. So part of the Yemma Festival, if you can move to the next slide, please, Kai, is we announce the Yemma Community Champion. I know there's plenty of Yemma Community Champions on this call now. So we would love for you to nominate um, a colleague and someone who's passionate about um, Yemma, um, you know, someone who's committed to employee engagement, knowledge sharing, collaboration, uh, oh, so we're, sorry, I'm just looking at your message, Alina. Um, I've looked at the report, I might have missed it, but where can we see the companies listed? Oh, uh, if you go to the contents, are these for the case studies? If you go to the contents, it just says small, medium and large size organisations. If you click on that, it will take you to the case studies and also on thriving communities, the next section. And I think there's about four or five case studies in there as well. Perfect. Thank you. <laughs> So we'd love for you to um, submit your colleagues as a Yemma community champion. And then the results of that, the champions will be announced at the Yemma festival, which is on December 7. So we'd love for you all to join us. We've got an amazing lineup of speakers. Um, you'll see just here some of the local ones, Cole Supermarkets. They've got a fantastic story about frontline workers that they're gonna share with us um, across all Cole stores in Australia. Um, the CSIRO is a pretty interesting one as well. It's a pretty complex organisation and they've managed to find a, uh, 
on Yammer, they've sort of uh, had this thing that you can find all your information within um, within 90 minutes, I think it is, that you need to have questions answered. So there's some really interesting organisations there as well. UNICEF is another great one you won't want to miss as well. So we've got um, three sessions around the world for the Yammer Festival. If you just scan that code or Coco shared the link in the chat there, you can register. Um, we'd love you to join all three sessions or um, perhaps the APAC one is probably best for our time frame. So has anyone got any more questions they'd like to ask of Laurie or Fiona? If not, Let's finish up a few minutes early, which is always nice. Grab a cup of coffee. It's lunchtime anyway. And I want to thank everybody for joining us. Um, it's been really great insights from you, Fiona and Laurie. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you for having me. Thanks, Fiona. Really appreciate that.